My name is Adrian Roberts. In 1966, I was a lieutenant commanding three troop, one APC squadron in South Vietnam. And I've been asked to recount to you uh, one of the actions in which the troop participated, that, that action which is now called the Battle of Long Tan. Before I do that, I think that it's necessary to explain to you some of the background that uh, lay behind the troop and indeed the squadron. You may not be aware that the squadron was raised in June of 1965 and committed to Vietnam uh, exactly 12 months later in June of 1966. It drew its officers basically from 1st Armoured Regiment and its NCOs from 1st Armoured Regiment with a few from the then A Squadron 4th 19th, Prince of Wales Light Horse. Many of the NCOs in fact were troopers in their second six year engagement and the bulk of the soldiers, those who were to be the, the troopers as it were in the squadron, came from the first and second intakes of the National Service and some went on to become very good NCOs. The squadron was raised in Pakapanyo. It was raised under Major Bob Haggerty. At that stage uh, we drew our equipment from the ordnance uh, in Bandiana and we knew at the, right from the word go that some of us at least would go to reinforce or eventually replace the then one troop which was serving with one RAR in Vietnam. It was quite a sensation to be able to draw carriers, brand new, that you knew perfectly well that you might see action in. However, not all was not rosy because we had to create a viable squadron in what was to be a very short time. And I was never aware whether Major Haggerty knew that or not, but certainly we worked intensively to create the squadron. Now you should understand that we had absolutely no guidance as to how an APC squadron was to function and so we followed British manuals rather slavishly. We had no radios, indeed up until the time I left for Vietnam we had no radios and we had no intercommunication, that's to say the capacity for the commander to talk to the driver. As a result we learnt by heart endless APC drills uh, through the medium of a, a rather complex system of hand signals uh, with, the, with the troop leader having a 25 set strapped onto the back of his, his turret. Now those drills would were practiced over and over again but at no stage were they ever practiced with infantry so if you can appreciate our training was done entirely in isolation we had the mechanics of every known infantry mechanized movement but we had no infantry at any point in our training so much then for the background of the squadron little by little members went to replace uh, members who'd fallen by the wayside in Vietnam and eventually it fell to three troop my troop to move to Vietnam towards the end of April. In fact, if I remember rightly, we arrived in country on the 1st of May, uh, 1966. And we, in fact, were going there to take over the vehicles uh, of the then one troop commanded by Captain Bob Hill. Um, we arrived at Benoit, and within two days, we participated in tail patrols. Subsequently, we participated in War Zone D and then towards the end of May and the beginning of uh, June, we moved with the 173rd Airborne into the area that was to be occupied by the 1st Australian Task Force to carry out what in effect uh, amounted to a uh, clearing of the area preparatory to the Australian arrival. Now this is significant because it meant that in fact three troop, albeit under the control of one troop at that time, was operating and did operate in the area in which the Long Tan battle was to occur. And because of that, we had detailed knowledge of the terrain which we might not otherwise have had. In fact, what took place was a uh, rather long battle uh, at the village called Long Phuc, which lies uh, immediately to the south uh, west of the area of Long Tan, in which the Americans took uh, some considerable casualties in overcoming what was at that stage a defended village. When the Australians came subsequently, of course, the village was deserted and subsequently uh, remained that way throughout, throughout my time. That provided three troop with some unique advantages, if I can sum up at this point. Firstly, it was well trained in conventional infantry APC tactics, although without infantry. It had operated in a variety of uh, areas in Vietnam within a space of a month, so it had some level of operational experience, uh, which was different shall I say, to that which followed with the Australian forces. And it enjoyed this unique short period where it actually operated along the uh, creek line uh, and the, the northern area of Long Phuc, which formed 
as you'll see, quite an important part of uh, our approach towards long tan. I think that's all that I wish to tell you uh, about the background, except perhaps to mention and re-stress the fact that the APC squadron had had no training with radios, although when we took the vehicles over from, three from one troop, they had American radios, which were the equivalent to the old PRC-10 uh, vehicle mounted sets, uh, that the troop vehicles were in an extremely tired state to be charitable about it. There were, for example, very few pivot steers that worked. They were all worn out. The radios uh, gave us the facility for the commander to talk to the driver and IC, and that was the, perhaps the most important thing. There was basically no facility to talk to anybody else in the back. In other words, we couldn't communicate with the infantry passengers. But we were unique in the squadron because we had intercommunication. Now, that led, in fact, to three troop enjoying many more uh, operational tasks in the first period of the Australian Task Force deployment than the other troops, simply because we had IC. So the cumulative effect was a fairly experienced troop by the time uh, we come to the period of long tan. Now to the battle itself. As has been said, the perception of any battle is really that which the, the viewer takes in, and the man next door to him is going to see something quite different. So I prefix my remarks on this battle by saying these are my perceptions, and more importantly, perhaps, they're my recollections after quite some years. I'll try and give you the flavour of the battle rather than the dull history. So I'll start my narrative by describing the night before the battle. There was nothing terribly significant about that night except that we got mortared and that I assembled, as I recall, my section sergeants and sergeants and corporals to give them a talk on close DF, which at the point when the firing started, or should I say the impact started, I thought we were under close DF fire. And as it crept closer and closer, I realised that either the artillery were enthusiastic or I'd made a, made a rather interesting misinterpretation and we jumped back in our carriers. Now, what we didn't realise at the time, of course, was that across the task force, we were located here. Across the task force, the SAS artillery engineer element was being pasted uh, with, with mortar fire at that time. Nothing happened after the mortar fire. Eventually we were stood down sometime in the morning and things returned largely to normal. And the following day, the morning as I recall it, was, was quiet. Indeed, that afternoon we went to attend a concert given by Cold Joy and Little Patty, uh, and that was going on. And I remember listening to the artillery starting to fire. First of all, there was battery fire, and then gradually it built up and up and up until there was regimental fire, and it was consistent regimental fire, and it was going out across this direction. And of course, most of the soldiers were busily engaged with ogling little Patty and what have you, and they didn't pay attention to this. And it, it was only the fact that I'd heard regimental fire from the Americans that made me realise that something was happening. The concert came to an end. My soldiers took my carrier and drove little Patty up here to 5 RAR as a sort of tour of the task force. And uh, eventually, my carrier was returned. Now, this was about 5 o'clock. At that time, uh, I got the old familiar message, the Major wants to see you with your map, and my heart did pit-pats, and I dashed across uh, to see Major Haggerty. I was told that the troop was to move to 6 RAR, to the operations officer, and we'd be given further orders there. Uh, so, there was a short heart starter while I waited for my carrier to come back up the road. I mean short because it was actually approaching, thank heavens, at that time. Jumped in the carrier, grabbed the soldiers, troop and around we went from the squadron round the airfield to 6 RAR where Major Passy, the operations officer together with the CO of the battalion and Major Honor, the New Zealand artillery commander were head down over a map. At that point Major Passy took my map from me, marked a square which is about a grid square in China Graph and said I want you to get up to A Company, pick them up, get out to D Company and break up the attack. D Company's here and you do the, the circle on the map. Battalion headquarters was roughly centre on this not the scale map. So up we drove to A Company. Now A Company, if I can describe it, was in a total disarray at this point in time. They had come back in from a several day patrol. They had obviously been in the process of standing down and getting fresh rations. And then they'd been stood to and, and mustered again for this new task. So if you can imagine the panicked soldiers rushing around, were being thrown over their shoulders, trying to scoop food off their plates into them into their mouths and trying to be organised into the carriers. That was the kind of 
situation that we're in. And the time, it, is, it was about half past five going on quarter to six when we finally started out on our journey. Now at this stage we really had no inkling of the magnitude of the problem with D Company. You'll remember all that I got was the circle on my map. I got no further orders here in A Company, but I knew where I had to go and you'll recall I told you that, I, that the troop had operated in the area, so I'd already plotted my route. It is noteworthy, however, that we drove off around the task force area. This road at that time was blocked off, heading for the known gap in the wire, which was along the engineer fence, boundary fence. When we arrived here, the boundary, had, the gap in the fence, of course, had been closed off and had not been notified to the remaining units of the task force. You can imagine this is meal time. These people are not aware of what's happening out here. So we then had to dismount and run around lickety split trying to find someone to tell us where the gap in the wire was. You couldn't drive through the wire because the wire was just so heavily built naturally in front of an engineer position. It was pretty well developed. Eventually we found someone and they showed us the gap and we set out on a journey. Not before squadron headquarters had called me up and told me that at this stage the CO of the battalion had now decided that he wanted to go by APC to the area of the battle. Or at that stage it was a contact uh, in our minds. At that point I sent my troop officer, Lieutenant Savage, Lieutenant Ian Savage, back with one other carrier to pick up the CO, indicating to him that I would continue on uh, on my journey towards this uh, particular battle. Having got clear of the engineer wire, we now proceeded, and if I can use this map which comes from General Hopkins' uh, book, we proceeded to move across the area of, uh, in fact, swampland that, l that lay at that stage between the engineer position and the 6RAR position uh, to skirt the northern outskirts of the Long Fook village that I referred to earlier. Now, Long Fook, in fact, is bounded by a line of rubber, or was then bounded by a line of rubber trees, uh, rather like a line of pine trees delineating the, the edge of the village. I knew from experience with 173rd Airborne that this bridge had been blown and was down. I also knew that the area along this creek line was heavily terraced, paddy, and that to get in and get out of that creek was going to be a monumental undertaking. Therefore, I consciously opted to head towards this point across the creek. There is a, an, an agri or was an agricultural dam and I knew that I could get in there because there was a bullock cart entrance on one side and exit on the other, so there was no problem getting in and out of the creek. I knew also that I'd have no problem negotiating the water because I couldn't go downstream because I'd be banged against the, the dam wall. So that's why we took that approach. As we journeyed around the northern outskirts of uh, Long Fook, there was the most tremendous rain shower, as some of you have served in the tropics will be familiar. It came down buckets. The ground is red. Uh, laterite I believe, it was really heavy going and we began to labour quite a bit getting around there but, but that rain in fact I think concealed the fact that we were moving because at this point that area there would have been visible had it not been heavily raining. Got down to the creek crossing here and the first of the problems uh, occurred in that most of the vehicles had no pivot steer. Now because they had no pivot steer they're difficult to handle in water. The problem of the rain uh, had uh, accentuated our difficulties because the flow of the creek was now well over vehicle speed. And what took place was a series of entries into the water followed by circular manoeuvres, if I can describe it as such, with us sort of turning upstream, being washed by the force of the current down across the wall and juggling ourselves across the, the uh, creek, which was, I guess, probably uh, in the vicinity of uh, 30, 40 feet, certainly as wide as this room of, of current with the dam wall at the back end. Eventually I got all my people across except one which uh, one carrier which at that stage uh, I left behind at the creek crossing to secure it. That vehicle was commanded then by Lance Corporal O'Shea. At this point, and I sh am remiss here from not recalling it, I, w I received orders in fact to hold by that wire up there at the engineer position but I was aware from listening to the battalion net that the, this company was now in quite considerable difficulty uh, with the action that was taking place against them by the Vietnamese forces. And the indications were that unless someone got out there pretty quick, they, they were going to go under. 
So I ignored the order to hold here. I received yet another order when I'd crossed that creek to hold there and to wait for the battalion commander to join me. The significance of not holding uh, you'll see subsequently. However, I concede quite freely that I disobeyed two sets of orders to hold at that point. My carrier force uh, at this point in time was now reduced to seven carriers. At this point, having crossed the creek, I was aware of tremendous artillery fo fire falling in the area of rubber. Now, if I can describe the ground that we had to traverse, this bottom area, in fact, which is described here as swamp, was in fact disused paddy, paddy that had fallen into disuse. If I can now describe the ground over which we actually fought, from the area of the creek here, the, the, the Sui de Bang, the ground designated on this map as swamp, in fact, was paddy fallen into disuse. And in point of fact, this area in the immediate uh, east of the creek was a series of banana plantations which stretched up to the road and slightly across. The rubber, uh, just north of the road, was young rubber, and the significance of this was that the, the uh, foliage of the rubber was about the same height as a crew commander's head in an APC. Further in, in the area just north of the enemy contact, it was very tall rubber, much like the normal great big white gums that you see around here in Canberra, that sort of height. And that tall rubber, in fact, continued more or less all the way into the area of the actual D Company location. At this point in time, I decided that I would put myself, uh, that is to say, my seven remaining carriers. As you'll recall, I'd left two back here to pick up the task force commander, one to secure the creek, and I had started with ten, not the normal thirteen carriers of an APC troop. I would put myself in what we then called a two-up formation, that's to say one section of three carriers to the left, which was carrying an infantry platoon, one section to the right, which was carrying the uh, other infantry uh, platoon and company headquarters in the centre, and an extremely crowded vehicle it was. I then uh, decided that the location of D Company was such that my best approach would be uh, and no room here for subtleties, to uh, put myself astride what was a sunken road uh, and drive up the road. Now the formation that we adopted, or that I'd, I decided to adopt, was a two-up formation with a section either side of the road and myself running parallel to the sunken road. Sergeant Richards commanded the carriers on this side and Sergeant O'Reilly commanded the carriers on that side. One significant point was that the three carriers on this side lacked gun shields and also lacked IC. In other words, they were newer carriers. The old carriers were on this side and here. We then commenced to adv advance north up the road. Initially, there was the artillery fire coming down ahead of us. If you can imagine, dust quite a way away, at least oh, 800, 9,000 yards up the hill. I'm saying it how it came into... It, I couldn't tell you how far ahead of me it was, but it was up there and we were going towards it and we figured that behind it there was going to be D Company. From the right hand side we started to see these figures moving through the rubber and uh, you'll recall that I told you the undergrowth was down, the canopy of the trees was about crew commander height which made it hard but these fellows were moving in arrowhead formation and they were moving in good order, it was raining and at first sight we thought we were looking at D Company. My right hand carrier commanded by a fellow called Corporal Goss said their enemy and began firing. And what we were looking at at that stage was about a company strength of these people moving in arrowhead formation across our front and clearly unaware of our approach. And again I attribute that to the rain. Gross began firing. My perception at that point in time was that only one section of infantry had got out of one of his left hand carrier. In fact, I learnt that the whole platoon got out and I learnt that only recently which goes to bring up the point that you can't tell everything uh, just from your own vantage point. But if I can digress here, what you must understand is that in those days we sat up behind the gun shield on the carrier. We were not locked down in the way that people are now with the turret. Indeed, I had a board across the top of my uh, hatch, which was rather stupid because in the event I couldn't drop down. But I did that because the problem that I, we constantly faced in Vietnam was the delicate balance between cowardly custody inside and the need for information as an officer and so I kept myself propped up with the board. Looking at these fellows sweeping across our front, we began to engage them, but the problem that we faced at that point in time was that if these weren't D Company, and really what made Gross, I learnt subsequently, realise that they were the enemy, 
was the camouflage on the back. From the front they were in greens, they had green hats on, they had webbing and in the rain they looked like our fellows. And I'll amplify the difficulty of identification subsequently uh, on another point. We commenced firing at them but I had all the time the concern that we weren't sure where D Company was. We knew that it was up ahead, we still had this general indication that we'd started with. We obviously couldn't interrupt the drama that was going on up there by asking them for things like lock stats, so we pressed on, but I was very concerned about overshoots. We simply fired and advanced and ran into these people and I suppose ran over them. I will say that they displayed tremendous discipline and drill as they fell back. Most of their people appeared to have sort of cane loops tied round their ankles and as you'd knock them over, other men in the squad or section would pick them up and drag them back while other men went down and fired, giving them covering fire as they pulled away and it was a, a very professional display, if I can say it, of my opponents. In my, my head I have a series of still pictures, if I can describe it, of those incidents so I can't give you a, a flowing narrative. All I remember is the, is the little pictures of men being knocked over by our fire, their fellows dragging them away. We pushed on through these people. At that point we ran into a second group which in fact was moving back the other way. So the first group had been moving across our front, the second group was in fact in the process of withdrawing. At this point we're quite a way into the rubber. The carrier immediately across the road from me, across the sunken road, was my ambulance. There was a tremendous explosion. I looked to his front and there was two fellows down with, with what looked like a tube over their shoulder and the other chap was putting around in the back and it looked for all the world like a drill manual of, of the loading of a weapon with a fellow carrying out his drills. He got the first round which hit a rubber tree and fell over. It's because of the action of loading it from the rear that I have always concluded that what I was watching was the 76mm which was subsequently recovered from the battle area. The second round that he fired hit the same rubber tree that had fallen across and that's all that saved the ambulance. At this point in time we had no communication with the ambulance because the small arms fire and machine gun fire had in fact cut away uh, his uh, radio antennas. The uh, corporal commander of the vehicle Corporal Carter very bravely, uh, as a result of his 50 calibre jamming due to his own slackness in putting the bolt stud in incorrectly and it fell out, leapt to the top of his turret, at this point you can imagine the troop has halted and we're all blazing away at people, leapt to the top of his turret and commenced to kill the crew of the 76 with his um, OMC. I'm showing my age, the OMC. And the driver threw magazines up to him and he reloaded them and carried on in, in an absolutely splendid fashion and I can still see him in one of these frozen pictures I carry in my mind standing there leaning into it exactly the way he'd been taught on the range at Puckapunyal killing these people in front. Now at that point a certain amount of the control went out of the battle. The, on the other side they had run into quite considerable small arms fire and my attention turned to them. I did not realise at this point in time that Sergeant O'Reilly in fact had been knocked unconscious uh, with a bullet graze. At Clements was hit and the carrier who was immediately on my left had stopped firing. In fact their 50 calibre had jammed and I'll tell you a small funny story about them in a moment. At this point in time if you can imagine we're sort of firing and rolling forward. It wasn't a matter of stop but from the moment that I discerned that there was an anti-tank weapon in the battle good Puckapunyal training came to the fore and I began to look for the second one because all my training had told me where there's one there must be two. We paused and we were looking out for this, this gun which I might add was never found because there wasn't a second one. The company commander at the time was the company 2IC and he remained throughout the battle inside the APC and down in the carrier and as you'll recall I had no facility to talk to him and sitting on a board right up the top with all this stuff flying around plus the artillery that was falling in front of us made communication extraordinarily difficult. There took place uh, a heated uh, exchange in which uh, I informed him that we were looking for the anti-tank weapon and he uh, was most concerned that we'd stop. We were looking for the anti-tank weapon. I turned my back on him 
and got on with the war. Now, I, I tell you this because this was fairly daring for a lieutenant to do, but the problem in those days was that there was no clear definition of who commanded the APC. We worked under the impression that whilst the infantry were mounted, we commanded the vehicles, and when they got out, they commanded the show. So they hadn't got out, logic, I was in command. So he was put back in his box. We then eased forward slightly, as I recall it, I became aware of the situation that the left-hand side had stopped dead. Turned my attention, because all this is sort of happening concurrently, it might sound a bit, I turned my attention to this side, and the crew commander, as I've said, Clements, had been, uh, in fact, mortally wounded at that point, although I wasn't aware of it. No answer on the radio from O'Reilly, because he was unconscious at this point in time, although I wasn't aware of that. He recovered consciousness subsequently. And immediately next to me, these two uh, National Service soldiers, in fact, uh, whose names, I, to my eternal shame, I can't remember, were carrying out a little antic, which I'll pause now and describe. They had uh, had a, a round jam in the barrel of the 50 calibre, and in the middle of this battle had had a discussion along the lines that if they didn't look at the enemy, the enemy wouldn't shoot them. So following this sort of ostrich theory, the driver stood up and unscrewed the 50 calibre barrel, and I can't describe the amount of small arms that was flying around in the, this time unscrewed the barrel and replaced it with a spare barrel, and then they went on fighting. Further over, Clements, who at this stage had collapsed inside the carrier from his wound, his driver had run forward and in fact run over the machine gunner that uh, had uh, counted for Clements. We had a difficulty then because we had no crew commander of that carrier. Two infantry soldiers appeared to climb up to take over the gun of the vehicle uh, that I could see, and they fell back inside and in fact were wounded. The company commander demanded that I send someone over to the vehicle, in fact, made to grab my radio operator, uh, who was a fellow called McCormick, an exceptionally short-sighted fellow, and which would have been a bad choice, because McCormick might have well have run the wrong way, not out of cowardice, just confusion. Um, he uh, was, was uh, pacified, and I sent Sergeant Lowe's, my troop sergeant, who was in the back of my vehicle, across. Now, Lowe's... Uh, did an exceptionally brave thing that day, and uh, I really feel sorry that, that uh, in my inexperience, he was never uh, cited for an award. He leapt from the carrier, and he was a fairly slim fellow of somewhat uh, brown skin, in other words, of Asian appearance, and he ran across, without exaggeration, 200 metres of quite bullet-swept gra ground to climb aboard to take command of this carrier, and an enthusiastic infantryman on that carrier almost dispatched him, thinking that he was someone from the opposition trying to come on board. He... Um, took command of the carrier and reported to me that there were three uh, seriously wounded people uh, in, the, in the vehicle. At this point uh, I made an error in that uh, I sent that carrier out of the battle uh, on the basis of three wounded people. I say it was an error because uh, I was not conscious of the fact that there was a platoon headquarters in that vehicle when I sent it out. And the platoon headquarters, I guess to make some defence for myself, made no attempt to change, change carriers. It went back and out of the battle carrying these three fellows out. I must admit, with further experience, I would have left them in there and gone on, and they would have or, or one of them would have died, but at that stage I was quite naive. At this point, while all this was happening on the left, the right-hand section of carriers had gone on their own to do a sort of John Wayne. They went hurtling up through the artillery, which didn't stop at any stage, past D Company, who got up and waved to them, did a loop realising that I wasn't with them and started back, which must have confused the enemy no end. I, O'Reilly had recovered consciousness. I and O'Reilly and Boss, the uh, other carrier that I told you about with a gunner jammed, closed up to uh, approximately this point here. At, we had to drive through our artillery at that point, which was quite an interesting experience. We then were joined at that stage by the CO uh, of 6RAR, Colonel Townsend, who'd come up with the troop officer. He asked me to assault eastwards, and so I formed up again in the same two-up formation, but this time with three carriers in rear, uh, and hooked in. And uh, I can only describe the fire that came at us at, as being, uh, well, something that was quite outside of my experience. The I do remember sitting in the, t in the top of this thing, and most of the other crew commanders remembered the same sensation of watching the trace. So it seemed somehow to drift towards you, and, 
and explode in white puffs against the trees. And I, I have always thought that they fired high because we kept on moving into them. That's really all that saved us from a bit of a catastrophe. We drove into this stuff and all the time they kept firing high, but the trace seemed to weave up at you and you had this quite strange sensation that you could weave from side to side and dodge it, which was quite absurd if you think about velocities. But that was, that was the impression. Then the fire died. At this stage, by my recollection, it was somewhere between quarter to and seven o'clock. It was getting dark. The rubber was all uh, hung with the smoke and cordite and whatever else, uh, and it was quite, quite eerie. We peeled back from that assault. We moved over and we formed an extended line uh, across, uh, facing eastward from the uh, what we thought at that stage was D Company. And to, in fact, it turned out to be company headquarters and two of the platoons. The other platoon was uh, lost. We then broke contact and moved into a uh, line, which uh, we, it was literally a straight line to the east of the what we thought was D Company, but turned out to be the company headquarters and two platoons, the third platoon being lost. At that point, A Company got out of the vehicles and lay an extended line between the carriers. So if you like, we were sort of aluminium and infantry war uh, between what we imagined was the main force to our east. A couple of points that I will mention about going in on that assault. In the early stages, I had two problems. One was the concern of overshoots and this problem, and so I was constantly telling my people to hold the line and to keep the fire down and to check fire because I was constantly searching ahead trying to see where the, our people were, that is to say D Company. The other problem was, and there's a lesson here for practising officers, that if you become engaged in killing the enemy, and by that I mean sitting behind a 50 calibre, hitting the other fellow as I was, you can in fact uh, become so absorbed by that uh, activity as to briefly pause uh, to lose sight of your command function. To that end, uh, I no longer subscribe to, at least in APCs and the like, to the commander being involved behind a gun because I uh, do not believe that uh, he's effective in that role. And I might add the South Vietnamese Army for what it's worth. I subsequently learnt, don't practice that either. The other thing is that uh, to try and give you some impression of what it's like, you, you're not frightened, you're totally absorbed in what you're doing and images float up like still pictures. You're not even conscious of killing other human beings. You, it's just like a series of still, still pictures. There is obviously a totally numb reaction, and I remember watching the infantry section from the right-hand carriers. You recall I said that they debussed and got back in, I should add. Uh, I remember turning to the company commander and saying, who the hell would have those blokes out? I think I was a bit more explicit than that. And he said, I did, from, or shouted up from, from the bottom, and I got on to Corporal uh, uh, Sergeant Richards, and we got them back in. But I remember the section going in immediately to my right, and the machine gunner was in fact doing all his drills except that he was firing into the air. Not out of any uh, dereliction, you understand, but just simply that sort of numbness that happens in that circumstance. Now perhaps others have not found it so, but I tell you this so that you might draw some lessons for your own uh, people in, uh, when you're talking to them on this sort of subject. That was my experience of that combat. Coming back to the point in hand, darkness was falling, we drew into this line, we lay down, darkness fell. In front of us we could hear all sorts of groans and moans and, and, and obviously the, the sounds of the dead and dying and the wounded. And behind us uh, the, this sort of total numbness uh, that existed in, in, in D Company. We stayed there I guess until about uh, 8 o'clock at night. Sometime during that period uh, B Company joined us. They had been out here in the middle somewhere. I'm not quite sure. Ne never to this day have I learnt where they were, but they somehow moved back uh, into this area. They had been the original company out there that was relieved by D Company. At this time, um, the CO wished to evacuate the wounded and the remnants of uh, the D Company, so I was given that task of carrying D Company out. I loaded all of the dead into the leading carrier and I had a very simple plan which was simply to drive out of the area 
uh, through the rubber into uh, an area which I knew, again from operating there with 173rd, that consisted of cleared paddy, old paddy and banana. So I had a very simple plan which was to drive straight out with the dirt in front and that if we ran into anything we'd simply herringbone, that's to say turn the carriers out like that, turn on the headlights and fire and fight. No, uh, no splendid prizes for manoeuvre there. A company uh, on foot, because there was no room to carry them of course, followed us out with the CO of 6RAR and B company I believe was between me and them, but quite truthfully I never did learn where they, what their deployment was at the back. We moved out of the, out of the rubber uh, into the uh, open area which was surrounded by bamboo and I formed the troop into a hollow square and put into action a, a thought that I'd had for some time. If I had to do a night evacuation, I turned the interior lights, the APCs on, the light shone up through the cargo hatch. Um, the CSM, who was subsequently killed uh, of D Company, prevailed on me to uh, conduct the evacuation. Not that I needed to be prevailed upon, but uh, because uh, one of the strange reactions, and uh, I say this in no way critically, because people do react in strange ways, was that the infantry soldiers were, were loath to handle their own dead. Um, so my chaps g gathered, gathered them up and uh, I had a couple of hand torches and, uh, and a radio and stood out in the middle of the square and you'll recall that we didn't really know where the, the bad, the enemy were, bad guys I was about to say. Um, at this point, uh, we'd been joined, of course, by A and B Company, who filled in the gaps between the APCs, sort of lying on, in line. Um, and then I simply called in the helicopters uh, to take out firstly the wounded and, and then the dead. Um, the um, American helicopters were excellent, as I remember them. They, they didn't go over the eastward area, as I kept telling them not to stay away from the area of the contact, because we really didn't know what the situation was over there. They came straight in, lickety split on the ground, took their people away. The our Air Force chaps were braver and chose to do circuits over the over the area of the contact for reasons quite beyond me. Um, but they came in and they they took the people out. And um, then we stood too for the rest of the night. The CO and uh, the OC of A Company uh, sat in my carrier, and uh, we just sort of looked glassy eyed at each other for the rest of the night, um, um, imagining that at any stage we were going to be. Um, followed up by, uh, by heaven knows what. I certainly didn't, but uh, we stayed there. In the morning, um, a company of 5 RAR joined us, the rest of 6 RAR and the rest of the APC squadron. The CO of 6 RAR issued orders uh, for a sweep that would in fact take us back through the contact area, and D Company 5 RAR, which was the company from 5 RAR, we're told to circuit this other hill up here, which is incidentally also called Nui Dat. The only unique thing I remember about those orders were that they were all given in clear. Um, and then we set off back into this contact area, and I uh, was given the privilege of carrying D Company. Um, and they had, there's no doubt, no question about this, they, they fought a magnificent battle. Now what I'm going to tell you now is to try and convey to you the way it was. It had rained, as you'll remember, we went back into the area and the first bodies that we came across were, a, were three men and they had no boots on and I tell you this story because it brings home the difficulty of telling who's who. We were dreadfully upset when we saw from the top of these carrier the three bodies without any boots on because we thought they were our own chaps and it wasn't until we got out on the ground that we discovered it was a 60 millimeter mortar crew uh, who in fact had been killed by artillery fire without being macabre. Uh, one chap's brain was out neatly on alongside his head. Um, we then continued on, and the most amazing sight, there was an Australian infantry soldier leaning against a tree um, in, in a state of shock. He was a, a left-behind fellow from the, uh, the platoon that had been the missing platoon of D Company. Um, I didn't actually speak to him, but he was just simply leaning up against a tree. I understand the Vietnamese had tried to take his boots off him and he told them to F off and uh, they had and not, not uh, touched him. Uh, anyway, he survived but he was uh, in quite a state of shock. We then continued on uh, into the battle uh, area, that is to say back where the company headquarters had been uh, and then subsequently across to w in the general direction where the missing platoon had last been seen by their platoon sergeant who I think I'm right in recalling was the Sergeant Berwick. 
uh, we came to that platoon and uh, because it had rained all the blood and stuff had gone and they were, they were lying in a straight line as if they were asleep um, the enemy were well there was a wheeled machine gun which was perhaps about from here to the end of the room which is what uh, 40 50 feet perhaps from this line the platoon commander was lying out to the right about 20 yards I suppose over there dead with an AK-47 in his hands as I remember his uh, SLR I think it was had run out of ammunition the uh, the line of the other soldiers they were lying in fairly clean undergrowth under the rubber uh, in, in a straight line um, one of them was still alive um, second from the left as I remember with but with gas gangrene many of them uh, had been shot uh, through the head. The one of the difficulties that is worth noting at that point in time was that when people came to take the weapons from the soldiers, the, the dead soldiers, they still had rounds up the uh, in the in the, in the chamber, and I al almost saw one of the uh, A Company infantry soldiers, uh, D Company infantry soldiers, dispatched by a lad who was dead, but hand still on the weapon, and it went off. Much the same as the uh, clearing of the foreign weapons, the same difficulty. Um, I can't sort of uh, explain to you how it was. It was like totally hushed and terribly depressing, terribly quiet. Um, then we uh, we sort of cleared around the area and evacuated this uh, fellow and there was, a, 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 as I remember, a wounded uh, Vietnamese found, found there and he was evacuated. Um, then in front of us, because they'd obviously uh, slugged it out until they were dead, I guess, there were large numbers of uh, Vietnamese dead and weapons everywhere. Walking further into the position, that's to say further east, subsequently I came upon the most enormous concentric series of uh, weapon pits. There must have been in excess of 200 weapon pits, beautifully dug, uh, with uh, a large stone in many instances over overhead protection in the centre. There were two firing bays at each end. What led us to those, in fact, was a series of telephone wires that were running from, from the area of the D Company uh, battle uh, to this position. So that had obviously been uh, one of their positions. Um, at that point, we dropped D Company and we started to sweep down here. We got to the corner of this area here and found what appeared to be mortar base plate positions and then I'm afraid my uh, long tan battle finished because uh, one of my carriers ran sideways into a trench that was probably dug by the French, it was all under grass and I'm afraid we spent the rest of the day, I'm not afraid, we spent the rest of the day trying to dig a carrier out that was on its side so that was the end of, uh, of long tan for us. That night we went back in with the rest of the battalion and took up a defended position on the area of the contact. Um, I can only say that I slept as if I was unconscious. We were pulled out the next day uh, and went back to the, the task force. Um, I think the only sad um, and macabre climax was that the ca carrier that carried the dead out was, uh, when the floorboards were lifted, it was full of blood and um, we could never quite get into that thing without smelling it. Sorry. Um, and that was, the, uh, that was the end of the battle. Oh, I'm sorry. Must be getting old. Now, um, there are a couple of points that I'd, I'd like to to make about this uh, battle. Um, the first one is that in no way am I trying to represent here that the third troop did anything uh, that would compare with the efforts of D Company uh, in slugging out in that, uh, in that circumstance that they fought out that afternoon. But what you've got to understand is that from our point of view it was, a, it, it was the most important thing that we'd ever done and for some of us um, it was probably the peak of our sort of military uh, professional uh, contribution. Uh, so it, I was very proud of the soldiers uh, of Three Troop and the way that they 
conducted themselves. No one backed off and everyone went in. I can remember no hesitancy uh, on the part of anyone in, in doing anything. Uh, indeed, uh, if I can say, the rest of the APC squad, if it felt anything, it felt cheated that it wasn't, wasn't there. Um, subsequently to the battle, um, I was criticised because uh, it was believed that uh, we had taken too long to get out to the, uh, to the battle. I would like to say categorically that I believe that there is no way that we could have got there through what we fought and across the ground that we traversed any faster than we, we did in fact, bearing in mind the technical problems at the uh, water crossing, the lack of communication and the fact that we had to fight through a couple of infantry companies to get there. Um, however, I accept the censure for sending back the platoon com commander and the um, platoon headquarters. That was a decision that I made in isolation because of the tremendous problem of talking to the company commander who, as I've said, remained inside the APC at the back. Um, the other thing that I would like to uh, to uh, record is that we had, had no chance for orders, that we really ran on my knowledge and the troop knowledge of that ground and the determination to get there. Um, and I realised that I did disobey the orders to hold, but I believe to this day and will go to my death believing that had I not done so, uh, these people would have been overrun. I uh, cannot stand being in a pine forest or anything like that about seven o'clock at night. That's my one heritage. Thank you. If there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. I've got one I'd like to ask. Uh, you have indicated the time frame of this engagement late in the afternoon and early evening. Um, there is a painting which is uh, portraying the Battle of Long Tan in which your APCs are shown going into the assault with their headlights on. Did you in fact use headlights during the initial assault or when you did the clearing movement to the east? I certainly gave no order to turn, turn headlights on. Um, to be quite honest, I can't remember whether anyone had, did or didn't have their headlights on. I don't recall my own uh, headlights on. Um, not to say that my driver, Piggy O'Rourke, mightn't have done so, but certainly I don't remember the headlights uh, at any stage. As I s said in the presentation, we had the plan of turning them on on the way out, but that never eventuated. Um, if I can describe the way... If you can imagine a pine forest here in Canberra and uh, on a uh, winter's night, uh, I'm speaking now towards the end, the visibility was about what you'd find uh, about half past five. If you can imagine it all hung with mist as a result of uh, the artillery and whatever, that would just about give you the, the, the level of visibility. In other words, I could see quite clearly uh, ahead of me, but it was, it was getting gloomy, if I can describe it as such. Good. Thanks. Um, you said earlier that when you went to battalion headquarters, before the contact started, you were still back at New Dat, that you were told to move to a grid square and that you then moved to A Company and picked them up. Could you tell me um, if you issued formal orders to your troop and if so, what they consisted of? Did you, did you expect at that stage to go straight into a contact or did you expect to go into a holding area and then be called forward? No, um, the way it was, in fact I can remember the exact words, uh, I want you to get up, pick up A Company, get out to D Company and break up the attack. Now they were the, they were the precise words, at which point Major Passy drew this uh, with his chinograph on my, on my map, uh, this square, which was about a grid square in size. Now, I left uh, battalion headquarters, which was uh, in the centre of the, the battalion position, and uh, ran down to the, uh, about uh, 500 yards down to the entrance of battalion headquarters, grabbed my chaps and said, we've got to get up to A Company. Now, frankly, uh, I had begun to nut out the route that I was going to follow to that grid square that had been indicated even as I was on the run, recalling that I said we had previous experience. I had anticipated that we would get formal orders of some description uh, when we picked up the infantry company. Um, but that's not to overemphasize that point because in very few, in fact I cannot recall any operation uh, where I picked people up and dropped them off in that kind of circumstance where I ever got formal orders. I mean one would get formal orders at the beginning of a battalion operation as such. 
but the uh, sort of incidental orders were not given. Now, as to what I did with my own troop, they were told that D Company was in trouble. They were told uh, the route that we were going, and that's all the information that I had. The rest of my orders were given on the move, two up and whatever else. Um, so there was no formal orders. Now, in the case of, uh, of uh, A Company, as I recall it, uh, I simply said to the uh, Company 2IC, who was acting as the company commander because uh, um, Major Smeaton had been wounded about six days ahead before, I think, on Operation Hobart, or quite some time before, uh, I simply said to him, this is the route. And uh, the only other uh, exchange, I suppose, we had that was that he actually asked me, uh, I think we're about here, actually, uh, oh, and once more, just here, uh, what our lockstat was, because he was obviously sending them back into... When I say ask me, he shouted up from the back through the back. I, I should perhaps have described more clearly to you. I was sitting up on the board, if you can imagine me here, and the, uh, alongside me, in fact, I had an M60 machine gunner who I might add subsequently in that action was had a bullet graze across his forehead and was busily firing his machine gun left, right and centre. And there was a couple of other, oh no, old, uh, I can't think of his name now, my operator, radio operator, the fellow with the uh, short sight, was sitting, had his head beavered around this side and Lowe's. And I was sort of talking to them and talking to him. And the company commander was down there in the well of the cargo hatch, uh, if you're familiar with an APC, sort of against the radio. In fact, I could only sort of half see him most of the time. The, I think the FO was sort of more in the open, uh, like down, but in the open. Um, no, I, I guess the short answer is no, I did, there were no formal orders uh, other than route directions and... Uh, orders as we went. The reason I asked that is that, that I thought that might have been the case and it, it's, um, you know, during the First World War Montgomery's first contact supposedly his uh, platoon was told to turn to the right and attack that hill and it just seems that these sort of things continue and that nothing is ever different. Well I'll tell you that's, that's an interesting question. You don't have time. Um, it's rather medieval. You're sort of in the middle and the, the, your fellows are on either side and you go and they conform to you. Um, and when you don't go, they stop. It's as simple as that. And uh, to be quite honest, uh, you're so busy controlling, keeping the line is perhaps the most, so one doesn't get ahead of the other. And you'll recall how the right hand got away from the left. Um, and this other thing, which I now regard as a weakness, that's the involvement in killing the enemy as opposed to commanding the troop. Uh, you've got to be very careful of that. Um, and I can vividly, well I won't go into it, but I can vividly recall the particular target that I was engaging at the time when I realised that, you know, there was a left and right in, in the business. Uh, and it's very hard, of course, to command and be up there and be exposed and know damn well they're shooting at you because, you know, I, I can still see them kneeling and firing. Um, I... It's, it's, you know, and then you shake your head and you come out back and afterwards. And I think the thing is that if you, it's a matter of drills over and over again until you, until you do the thing uh, properly. And perhaps what Montgomery did was really the end product of a drill. Is this, that numbness that I described uh, takes over. See, driving through the artillery, I can remember my tin hat was, I always kept my tin hat down on the engine deck. And I leant down and put it on my head. Bloody silly gesture because, every, you know, I'm not Mickey Mouse and uh, there's a lot of me exposed other than the tin hat. But I did it as an instinctive... Uh, instinctive uh, thing. Sorry, that's getting well and truly off the subject. Adrian, in the initial contact with the enemy, you said that uh, what appeared to you to be a company was moving to the left and then another company moved to the right. In retrospect, what do you think they were doing? In fact? I, I believe these people were saying that one more wave and they would be overrun. That's D Company. That was the message that, that was coming over when we were here. I believe, and I, you know, I'm no... Uh, authority on this, but I believe what I was seeing was an envelopment movement to get behind, because when, when we went in there the next day, the bulk of the dead were there, going that way. Now, I think what I ran into was a flanking movement, and I believe that um, the first company, and they were well in excess of 100 men, if you can imagine, platoons moving in Arrowhead, they were beautifully uh, formation, very, most professional, um, until we started to mess it up a bit. Um, they, uh, and then they withdrew in, in, in really first class order. The next company that we ran into, as we kept closing forward, because we were running over these people, you understand, um, obviously it worked out what they had made, two and two made four, and they were going out of it uh, in, in good order. I might add that the fact that 
uh, a, a lot of the casualties weren't uh, there when we went back in the next day. Uh, that's to say when the, the task force went back in, there wasn't an enormous number of people down there. I can only attribute to the fact that you may not be aware, but they ring the D Company um, area, particularly that missing platoon, or where that missing platoon was considered to be. They, re they boxed that in with artillery fire. All that night, the guns fired. And so in that area, the uh, NBAVC uh, had no chance to recover their people. Uh, I might add something that I did leave out there was that the next day when we went back in there, it, it, I tried to indicate to you how depressing and sad it was. Then they started to count the bodies, you see, and they got up to 10, 12, 18, and that was, you know, equal score, 19, because Clements died, uh, my, my lad died nine days later, you understand, from stress ulcers. We thought he'd made it, but... Then uh, suddenly the, the numbers are up, 100, you know, 200. I think it was about 245 or something at the end. I forget the number, but anyway, it was a, it was a very high number. And, uh, well, frankly, I can only say it was rather like a football match, but there was this terrible, flat, sucked-out depression uh, that morning, and it only really changed. The other thing I might mention about those casualties is that in the intimate area of the of D Company, most of them were small arms uh, victims. The vast majority of the people that I saw were artillery victims. Uh, very terrible effects. Uh, I saw it again on my second tour. You know when artillery bursts near you, the lungs get drawn up and all this sort of thing. It's bad. Just to pursue that matter about the casualties, did you see any indication that the battlefield outside the artillery fire had been cleared by the VC and that there could have been more casualties, in fact, than we collect? I believe, yes, because there were weapons and, uh, and there were, in fact, uh, to tell a, an aside tale, some four weeks later we were in that same area and found uh, decomposing uh, people that had been missed on the on, on the clearance. I vividly remember that because I was quite ill. Um, much to the amusement of my driver, Piggy O'Rourke, who was less sensitive. In envisaging the circumstances as you've described them, sir, a couple of queries uh, occur to me. Firstly, did you require an ammunition resupply? Um, secondly, um, was assistance available to you from helicopters during the remaining hours of daylight? And, and finally, if I could, um, did the infantry mounted in the APC um, engage targets from, from the cargo hatches? To take those in sequence, no. We never ran out of ammunition because the APC squadron ran in fits and starts. We were on one of the peaks. That's to say uh, we used to get more and more ammunition in first and second and third and fourth line for everybody else and his dog. And then a carrier would hit a mine and it would provide a fireworks display and they'd have a deep think and we'd go back to tours and carry minimum ammunition. We were on one of those peaks of ammunition so that wasn't a problem. Um, Helicopters, no, I was on my own. From the moment I left the engineers, uh, uh, I, I, I was truly on my own. Oh, well, that's to say A Company we were in the carriers, but I mean there was no, no aircraft or anything else in the, in the deal. And um, um, the uh, artillery, of course, was being controlled by the FO, a New Zealand officer with D Company, and he did an incredible job. Now, uh, the last question you had was... Uh, from the infantry. infantry. Well, that, that is a very good question because uh, Sergeant Richards, uh, who you recall was on my right, was almost killed. Uh, uh, the lesson I learned out of that is that the infantry can't fire from the vehicles when you're on the move because you can't control it and they've got no idea, that's to say the lads who have got their heads up over the cargo hatch, they've got no idea when the vehicle's going to come zooming up alongside them. Not only that, there's this uh, sort of enthusiasm that goes on and Richards got a bullet, bullet round through his gun shield on the left hand side from a, an enthusiastic lad who was sort of firing as Richard pulled his gun around to the left. Um, and the plain answer is that yeah, they did fire, but it was uh, incoherent fire, and I don't want to minimise the casualties that they inflicted, but the, the problem of controlling that fire is quite enormous. It's qu quite difficult enough with machine guns on a carrier without all these other chaps banging away. And the lad, you remember the chap that was on my side with the M60? When the bullet grazed him, he sort of swayed around with his gun a bit uh, until someone took the gun off him. But, you know, they'd been popping away. But it's a difficult problem. I've got one final one for you. You briefly mentioned that the um, D Company people who you found dead from the platoon that had been isolated had been shot through the head. Would you like to expand on that? Um, well, it was my impression that, uh, that, that, that they'd been sort of overrun, uh, you know, afterwards, I would think. And for some reason, that lad that was second from the left was intact. 